A reading from the book of Numbers. Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of spirits of all flesh, appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand upon him. Have him, have him stand before Eleazar the priest and all the congregation, and commission him in their sight. You shall give him some of your authority, so that all the congregation of the Israelites may obey. But he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, and who shall inquire of him by the decision of the Urim before the Lord, and at his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the Israelites with him, the whole congregation. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole congregation. He laid his hands on him and commissioned him, as the Lord had directed through Moses. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Again they came to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of the human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin, they were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as a true prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. The Gospel of Christ. We are now into Tuesday of Holy Week. A little bit out of order as far as the liturgical calendar is concerned, but in the Gospel of Mark, what it is that we heard read in our Gospel reading today is taking place on Tuesday of Holy Week. Sunday was a triumphal entry. Monday, Jesus came in and uh, cleared the temple and caused quite a ruckus. And now here it is, Tuesday morning, he comes back to the temple. We have been going through this mini-series on the challenging teaching of Jesus and started off with a couple of sermons pointed at his followers, at his disciples. But then last week, we started to see that his challenging teaching was directed to the people in Jerusalem and to the leaders of Jerusalem. The cleansing of the temple itself was a pretty powerful lesson to everyone. And then today, we see Jesus beginning what will be a series of instruction. And so we need to take a look at what's happening here. Now, I was originally going to draw something from chapter 12, but we heard instead from the end of chapter 11 because this exchange with the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders sets up everything else that happens in chapter 12. This exchange with the elders and the scribes and the chief priests are what sets the tone for the remainder of this day. And so it's worth starting with this. It's worth exploring this and getting to the gist of it so that we understand more of how to take everything else that happens over the course of Holy Week. So what happened? Well, as you heard Kathy read, it's the next morning and they come again to Jerusalem and they once again go into the temple. Again, remembering that just the day before, Jesus had come into the temple and started overturning things, shouting, My house shall be called a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of robbers. And everything gets thrown out of whack. Now they're back. And the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders come up to Jesus, and they confront him. And they say, we got a couple of questions for you. By what authority are you doing these things? As in clearing the temple the way he did. And who gave you this authority? The fact that they confront Jesus is completely understandable. In fact, they're actually doing their job. 
The chief priests are very much in the same vein of the high priest that had been appointed from the Torah onward. Aaron, the brother of Moses, was the first high priest. And it says in the Torah that of all the priests that are to be anointed, all of them need to be from the line of Aaron. They are to be from the tribe of Levi. And there is to be someone appointed as the high priest. By the time of Jesus' day, it seems that they have more than just one high priest now. They call them the chief priests collectively. But these are people specifically set aside for the role of governing worship in the temple of the Lord. The scribes would be the ones who would uh, communicate whatever it is that the chief priests are saying need to be done. They're the ones who are able to write things down and to uh, continue to work with the Torah and seek to understand it and so on. And then the elders, as I understand it, would be those who have reached a certain age who are appreciated for their wisdom and their uh, experience and insight. Um, Perhaps the elders might be priests emeritus. You know, they're, they're no longer serving as priests in particular, but they're respected for who they are. It might be a little bit different than that. But nevertheless, these three groups of people, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, are responsible for what's going on in the temple. And of course, the temple is understood to be the centerpiece of God's activity among the Israelites. It is the focal point for worship. And those who lived in Jerusalem got to see the temple each and every day. They got to hear and to smell the sacrifices that would be made morning and evening as Yahweh is being worshipped, as offerings are being made to Yahweh. The people who don't live in Jerusalem find themselves traveling to the city a few times over the course of the year for key events, like Passover, which is the time of year that it is at this point in the gospel. And they would then come in and be drawn again to this focal point of worship. The chief priests, scribes, and elders were the ones responsible for governing what took place in that temple. And I would suggest that they were doing their job in confronting Jesus. I mean, imagine you were, let's say, one of the Israelites from Galilee. You live up in the north, a three-day journey away. You do your thing every year, you know, and and a few times a year, you get to come down to Jerusalem and actually come to this magnificent structure known as the temple. And you want to worship appropriately. This this is your time. You're now there. You don't get to see this every day like the the, uh, people who live in Jerusalem. But now you're here. And you've made this journey, and so rather than bring animals with you, which would be a total headache, you're planning on exchanging your money for temple currency and then purchasing maybe a couple of doves to offer for your sacrifice because you're already not really, really wealthy, but you want to do this right. And so you're standing in line in the temple, and then this guy comes in who maybe you've heard of or maybe you've seen, but he's shouting and he's overturning the tables and setting the animals free and scattering the money everywhere, and now you're going what do I do now? I just traveled three days to get here. I want to worship Yahweh appropriately. How am I supposed to change my money now? How am I supposed to buy my sacrifices? Like, I can't just spend forever here. I got to get back. Like, how am I going to do this? Because this guy named Jesus has messed it all up. I think the people who were there would expect that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders would want to find out where this guy is coming from. Let's maybe look at it a little bit more personally. I see Noel is coming into the nave right now. What if he was some random guy from the street that came into the service right now and started shouting whatever it was he wanted to shout and then came in and flipped over all these glasses and pushed the candles off the holy table and tipped it over and kicked over the lectern and stuff like that and says, I have a message from God for you to listen to. I would expect that you would expect that I would have something to say to that guy, (laughs) that that I would not be doing my job if I didn't somehow confront this individual coming in and presuming to take over. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders are doing their job when they confront Jesus. And let's let's not forget 
that their understanding is what Jesus has done is incredibly challenging. They've been hearing about him, so they're already not so sure about this guy. But then he comes in and he does something just short of desecrating the temple when he cleanses the temple. I mean, he hasn't sacrificed a pig on the altar or something like that, but he has completely overturned everything at this centerpiece of the worship of Israel. And that's part of the reason why the previous day they were thinking, this guy needs to be done with. He is completely overturning what Yahweh says we are supposed to do. This is no small matter. And so they are already trying to figure out how best to approach him. And so they come up to him and they do what we would expect them to do. They ask him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? This notion of authority is something that is not something they've created. It's not something they've taken upon themselves. It's not something that they've just decided is important. It's integral to the way that Israel has operated. Our first reading was from Numbers chapter 27. And what's happening there is Moses, towards the end of his life, knows that he is not going to be entering the promised land. God has excluded him from that. He knows that he has to stay out and die in the wilderness while everybody else goes into the country. And so he is praying to Yahweh saying, the people need somebody. If I can't lead them, there needs to be somebody else to lead them so that they are not like sheep without a shepherd. And so Yahweh says to him, all right, I want you to take Joshua, son of Nun, and appoint him to this role. Give him some of your authority that he will be the people, he will be the ones to lead the people, telling them when to go and when to come in and all of these things. And so that's what Moses does. The authority Moses had possessed was now given over to Joshua, and Joshua is the one who now leads the people. And the whole train of years of development and history passing involves the leadership authority being passed on to the next person, the priestly authority being passed on to the next person, and there's always been this understanding that the people that hold these roles of responsibility are doing so because ultimately originated with God And then it was appropriately given by those who were given that authority earlier. The chief priests are the ones responsible for giving authority to people doing things in the temple. It is the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who are responsible for authorizing the activities in the temple of Yahweh. And so when they ask Jesus, by what authority are you doing things and who gave you this authority, they know that they had not given him that authority. And this was their job and their responsibility. So they're asking a very honest question. They are not being jerks to Jesus by asking him this. They are not just trying to make life tough for him. They really need to know how on earth do you figure that you can get away with doing this? Because we know that we did not authorize you to do this. Jesus' response to them is one that starts off being, well, kind of rabbinic. When, When the rabbis would discuss matters, they would often have one pose a question about a particular theological concern or whatever, and another rabbi might respond with another question. And and this would kind of be their way of going back and forth to delve into and explore the theological conundrum that they're trying to determine or what have you. So when Jesus says, well, I will ask you one question, answer me, and then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The fact that Jesus starts out that way kind of would be expected, being that Jesus was already known as a rabbi, that maybe this is what he's doing. But the nature of his question departs really from the questions they were asking. So it's not actually the same thing. It it goes to another direction. And so the question that Jesus asks of them, and he says, if you tell me the answer to this, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The question he asked was, did the baptism of John come from heaven or was it of human origin? And then he says, answer me. A bit of an authoritative kind of statement, kind of showing that he is taking control here. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it of human origin? 
And now if we were there that day, all we would have seen as we're wondering what on earth's going on here and okay, they're finally going to confront this guy or whatever, is we see them confront Jesus, we see Jesus ask the question, and then we see them go into a little huddle and they're talking among themselves and we can't hear what they're saying. But then they come out of the huddle and they say, we do not know. And then Jesus says, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You see, what happens in this conference between the chief priests, scribes, and elders was not something that was done publicly at all. They talked among themselves. It says here that they argued with one another. Another translation is to say they discussed among themselves. They got together and they didn't want everybody to hear what they were talking about. And they're trying to weigh out how should we answer this question. I mean, after all, we, we are in charge here, even though he seems to think he's in charge. And so we have to come up with the right answer. And so they're asking the question of themselves. They're saying, okay, if we say that the baptism of John was from heaven, then he's going to say, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say it is from human origin and it's just left dangling, and then an explanation is given. They were afraid of the people because the people were convinced that John was a prophet. They were convinced that he was one of the prophets like you read about in the Hebrew Bible. And after there had been a fair bit of time where there hadn't been prophets speaking, here we have a prophet of God and he looks a lot like Elijah even. We really want to pay attention to this guy. It's very clear that the chief priests and scribes and elders did not think that the baptism of John was from heaven. It did not have a divine origin. They were convinced it was of human origin. But they knew that if they were to say so, the people would be kind of up in arms. What are you talking about? How can you not see that this is a prophet of God? You're our religious leaders. We would have thought you would have seen this. And so they realized that they couldn't really give the answer. And so then at the end of their conference, they turn to Jesus and say, yeah, we don't know. Almost begging him to say, you tell us what you think. And then they could deal with it from there. But Jesus decided to simply say, then I'm not going to tell you by what authority I do these things. We then move into chapter 12, and we find that Jesus actually pretty much does give an answer now. He tells the parable of the wicked tenants, which is a parable that is clearly directed against the chief priests and scribes and elders for their failure to properly conduct themselves and to do their duties as they are required to do. And then after that, they send the Pharisees to come and ask Jesus a trick question. And then the Sadducees come and ask him a trick question. And he answers both of them in a way that they'd ever expected to see. And, and then we're told that after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. But then he starts asking questions. And he starts teaching more scenarios and giving a picture that people had not been thinking about. Everything in chapter 12 that Jesus teaches is something that was not the way anybody else had been thinking before. Which, when you think about it, makes sense. Because that's what Jesus has been doing all along. Now, it is interesting that the question Jesus poses to the chief priests and the scribes and the elders is the one that he does. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or was it from human origin? He's talking about John the baptizer. He's talking about John's ministry. And it's interesting that Jesus brings up John to these chief priests and scribes and elders. He doesn't bring up his own ministry. He brings up John's ministry. Now, why would that be? Well, again, as we look in the Gospel of Mark, it is clear that Jesus spent time with John. Jesus was one of the many people that John baptized in the Jordan River. We understand, of course, that there was this episode of the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus and this voice from heaven saying, you are my son, the beloved, but it could very well be that only Jesus actually had that experience. In the Gospel of Mark, it doesn't seem that everybody saw that, just Jesus understood that it was happening to him. And then he left, spent 40 days in the wilderness, right? And then when he comes back, John has already been arrested by Herod. And so this is when Jesus starts his ministry. 
And Jesus starts proclaiming something that is very much in line with what John the baptizer had already been doing. And so John had been doing his thing. Jesus came along, had been there for a while, gets baptized by John, takes off into the wilderness, comes back. John is imprisoned, so Jesus steps in and continues the ministry John had begun. And he says, repent, change your thinking, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, what was it that John was doing before that? He was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is that changing of thinking, right? So why would repentance fit with this idea of being baptized for the forgiveness of sins? Well, let me ask you this. How did the Israelites understood that their sins got forgiven? It was through the sacrificial system at the temple. It was through the offering of burnt offerings and thank offerings and wave offerings and grain offerings and all this stuff centered on the temple. That is how their sins were forgiven. On the day of Yom Kippur, yes, Yom Kippur, the, uh, one of the chief priests would go into the most holy place and offer a sacrifice for the sake of the entire nation for their sins to be forgiven. The way that sins were forgiven, according to Jews at the time, was through the sacrificial system in the temple. John the Baptist is coming out and saying, I want you to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Well, that's not the way we do it. Aha, hence the reason for repentance. Hence the reason for thinking differently. And John's ministry is basically saying, you can have the forgiveness of your sins without the sacrificial system at the temple. And in a way, we said, Jesus' cleansing of the temple the day before is kind of saying the same thing. Because 40 years from this point, the temple is going to be destroyed again. Jesus is continuing what John had already started. Jesus is expanding even more on what John has started. Absolutely he is. But it is along the same basic thrust. Now, this ought not to be a surprise to the Israelites. After all, the first temple had been destroyed quite a while ago. And if there is no forgiveness except through temple worship, then how on earth did the exiles have their sins forgiven for the 70 plus years that they were in exile? There's no temple. They're stuck in Babylon. They can't even go to Jerusalem. Were their sins not forgiven during that time of the exile? Was Yahweh not forgiving their sins? Did people die in exile without their sins forgiven because they couldn't be worshiping as they're supposed to at the temple? I don't think anybody was thinking that way. But now that the temple is back, they've idolized the temple again. And they've been putting their attention on this building in this place and having that be everything. And God's trying to get the message across that, that no, this is like an object lesson at best. And John the baptizer began preaching the forgiveness of sins without the sacrificial system. Jesus continued that ministry of John's and continues throughout his ministry going even further with that. The temple is not the central point. But forgiveness of sins is available. But you have to think differently. Jesus' question really starts to make them have to think about what it is they're doing. Yes, they're doing their job, but they've failed to understand the role the temple has had and how its time is coming to an end. Now, I have to wrap this up pretty quickly. What is it that we can come up with with this? It's all well and good to know that's what Jesus did to the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, but is there something for us to grasp here? Well, I think there is. And the thing for us to grasp is in what the chief priests and scribes and elders had in their little conference. When Jesus asked the question, the ministry of John, was it from heaven, was it divine, or was it of human origin? And they're trying to decide which way to answer that. For us, we could simply ask the question, what do we think of Jesus' ministry? Was Jesus' ministry divine, or was it of human origin? 
I don't think any of us are going to be in a hurry to say it was of human origin, but what are the implications of saying that it is of divine origin? If we were to be in that little conference asking the question, is Jesus's ministry of divine origin? If we are to say it is of divine origin, then he would ask the question, why didn't you believe me? Notice the question isn't, why didn't you believe in me? But why didn't you believe me? When they're asking the question about John, why didn't you believe him? It wasn't why didn't you believe in him? Believing in John the Baptist isn't the issue. It's believing what John the Baptist had to say. So if we're looking at Jesus's ministry, the question's the same. Why don't we believe Jesus? If I was to tell you, look, believe me. <laughs> I'm not asking you to believe in me, but to believe what I'm saying, what I'm communicating. And at this stage in this, the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, this question about John's ministry can be paralleled to the question of Jesus's ministry, and that's the question that we are asked. If we believe that Jesus's ministry is of divine origin, do we believe him? Which means, do we believe what he says? Do we believe what he's been teaching? Do we believe what it is he has been showing, what he has been demonstrating? There has been no crucifixion or resurrection to believe in yet. There has been nothing yet to suggest that there's anything more than what Jesus has already been doing from day one. Do we believe him? Do we trust that what he said is right? And if so, how are we putting it into practice? How is our thinking being changed because of what Jesus has taught and what Jesus has demonstrated? That's the question for us this morning. Amen.